few months ago, I made a video about making hydroxylamine from ammonium chloride via chloramine. The theory behind it was sound, but the actual method was deficient on many levels and it produced a low yield of poor quality product. In fairness, I was fully aware of this at the time and I even described it as a work in progress. This video showcases a vastly improved version of that method with the bonus that all the materials involved can be bought in shops or on eBay. As with the original method, it involves chlorination of ammonia to form monochloramine and the reaction of monochloramine with caustic soda to form hydroxylamine. In the original video, I speculated about some possible improvements and some of them were incorporated into this method, along with several other key modifications. I'll describe these in more detail at the end. However, I will say now that one of the ideas I suggested, namely adding hypochlorite and caustic soda at the same time, was absolutely terrible because it turned the starting material into nitrogen gas and utterly destroyed it. Before I start listing the reagents used, I will point out that three of them came from my local branch of B&Q, which is like Home Depot in the US or Bunnings Warehouse in Australia. See if you can spot which ones they are. Reagents used were ammonium chloride, 5.35 grams of that, a pH 8 buffer solution, which is 50 grams of that. Sodium dichloroisocyanurate dihydrate, 12.8 grams of that. Uh, caustic soda, 13 grams. Potassium carbonate, that's 28 grams. 37% formalin, which is 10 grams. 80 ml of isopropyl alcohol. Sodium bisulfate, that's 12 grams. For the recrystallization, also used industrial methylated spirit and acetone. And I also used deionized water, about 150 grams in total. The buffer solution was made up using 0.68 grams of monopotassium phosphate and 0.13 grams of caustic soda diluted to 250 ml with deionized water. Ammonium chloride was dissolved in a pH 8 buffer solution in a round bottom flask and cooled to fridge temperature. Meanwhile, SDCI was dissolved in 60 grams of water and caustic soda was dissolved in 39 grams of water. The caustic soda solution got pretty hot and was also cooled to somewhere near fridge temperature. An ice bath was set up and the SDCI solution was slowly added to the ammonium chloride solution via dropping funnel. There was some fizzing and foaming and quite a lot of precipitation but little heat was generated. The caustic soda solution was then added very cautiously because this is where things got interesting. As in the original procedure during the hypochlorite addition, a head of acrid white smoke soon developed above the mixture most likely free base monochloramine forming an aerosol with water vapour. This disappeared as addition continued, as did the yellow colour. The solution was transferred to a beaker because this made it easier to filter in the next step. Potassium carbonate was added, causing the isocyanurate in solution to precipitate out as a huge mass of fine white powder. This was removed by vacuum filtration. Formalin was added to the filtrate, the mixture was heated to 80 to 85 degrees for about 15 minutes and then it was cooled to room temperature. While this was taking place, sodium bisulfate was dissolved in 36 grams of water for the next step. The mixture was extracted using 140ml and two 20ml portions of isopropyl alcohol. The sodium bisulfate solution was added to the combined alcohol extracts and the mixture was concentrated by distillation, first at atmospheric pressure then under vacuum. As soon as visible precipitate was formed in solution, the distillation was stopped. The remaining water and product combined weighed 22 grams. To this, 8 grams of industrial methylated spirit were added, and once the solvent was boiling, 12 grams of water were added to dissolve all the solids. I chose 8 grams of IMS because from a past experience, a 2 to 5 ratio of IMS to water does the job very well, and I didn't know exactly how much water there was in there. As far as I'm concerned, it's better to start with not enough water than it is to overshoot. After being cooled overnight in the fridge, the product was recovered on the pump as large white needles and any solids remaining in the flask were washed out with acetone. The yield was 10.53 grams, which is 80% with respect to ammonium chloride, which is a vast improvement on the earlier form of this method. The product rapidly reduced an alcoholic solution of iodine to iodide without any gas evolution, and reduced permanganate when free based, but didn't reduce permanganate while present in its salt form, which is very acidic. The biggest flaw with the original method is that although hypochlorite chlorinates ammonia effectively, it is extremely reactive in general, and as a result, a lot of unwanted side reactions take place. 
Although SDCI is also a source of positive chlorine, it reacts more cleanly than hypochlorite does. With very little information available about how it behaves in chemical reactions, as it's mainly used as a sterilant, I assume both chlorines reacted, adjusted the quantity accordingly, and, as it turns out, they do. Another important point is that the pKa ammonia, that's the pH at which half of it exists in its protonated form and half of it is unprotonated, is 9.2. Assuming the henderson hasselbalch equation holds true, this means that at pH 9, about 40% of the ammonia is present in its unprotonated reactive form, and at pH 8, this proportion is reduced to around 5%, meaning there's less free ammonia present. For this reason, reducing the pH reduces the likelihood of side reactions and overchlorination. The other major flaw in the original method is that although hydroxylamine is more soluble in alcohol than ammonia is, its solubility in alcohol is still pretty poor, which makes it hard to separate. Heating it with formaldehyde in alkaline conditions converts it to formaldehyde, which is much more soluble in alcohol and much easier to separate. Once formaldehyde has been formed, heating it with aqueous sodium bisulfite, which is strongly acidic, converts it back to hydroxylamine, leading to much higher yields overall. The distillation step at the end is an important one as well. For a long time I struggled to get a yield over about 30 or 40% or a halfway decent purity of product, because I decidified it with hydrochloric acid, which causes the product to decompose during vacuum distillation as it dries, basically cooking it. I could probably have isolated the hydrochloride salt by recrystallising it in situ, which I did in this video, but I made the bisulfate salt to check the product was consistent with the one produced by the Rashid process, and also because I've got more than a kilo of sodium bisulfate sat round twiddling its thumbs. Overall, I've managed to refine this crude method into something that's practical, achievable with amateur accessible reagents, and a good deal more efficient than the method detailed in Brower. In doing so, I took ideas from multiple sources, and the overall method is now so far from a single source that it could almost be called original research. Also, I've got a couple more videos planned that will show how hydroxylamine can be used as an intermediate to make other equally useful compounds that are hard to find for many amateurs, so look out for them. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.